Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is John Janke, and I'm going to be your MC and host uh, for day one of this two-day conference. Um, so you only, you only get me for one day. Tomorrow you get uh, Dan Borsha, ABC commentator. So today is really the best day. Today is really the best day. But welcome to the Language Keepers, preserving the Indigenous languages of the Pacific Conference. Um, I'm sure by looking at the program you'll agree that we're in for two exciting and stunning days. Lots of uh, wonderful presentations, some great dialogue that's going to be had, and I would dare say some uh, robust but very important discussion around Indigenous languages. As you see in your uh, written notes, the, the conference is both the closing event surrounding the library's Cook in the Pacific exhibition, but it's also the first event uh, for the library in this, the 2019 UN International Year of Indigenous Languages. So it's important, uh, it's an important event. Uh, before I get, we get our first couple of speakers up, just a reminder that uh, if you've got a mobile phone, just switch it to silent. Um, I won't tell you to switch it off because we know how important those things are to our everyday life. Um, and also that this event uh, will be live streaming through social media. Um, so we'll be live streaming a lot of the sessions. Um, so just a reminder of that. Uh, it gives me pleasure now to get the conference underway. Um, and as is the custom, uh, I would like to ask uh, Paul House, Nambri and Ngunnawal custodian, to welcome us onto his country. Wurugawuri, John. Thank you, John. So, Baladu Yaba Nyambri Nunu Wuredri Nyang. I'm speaking Nyambri Wuredri Nunu language. Mijan Balda, Paul House. My name is Paul House. I'm son of Matilda House. I was born here, the centre of my ancestral country, at the uh, at the old Canberra Hospital. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about all that. And I'm just going to flick through some images, yeah. So, so Yilangalangbu, Gibabungal, Wugabu, Migabu, Deranil Bangmayin. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, young men, young women, distinguished guests, Nyari, Njamali, Nyambri, Wogalu, Wallabla, Nunuwu, Mujigang, Yanangbu, Janju. My respects to Nyambri, Wogalu, Wallabla, Nunuwu, elders past and present, Nyari, Njamarabu, Mujigangu. My respects to all people from all parts of the country here today. Nyambri Nunuwu Mayin Gai Mbanya Nyunyaga Nurumbango Dara. Nyambri Nunuwu people, welcome you all to country. And I'd like to once again acknowledge our ancestors and our elders for laying such a strong foundation for the younger generation to move forward. And as Indigenous Australians, as Aboriginal Australian, I wouldn't be here. Uh, if it wasn't for our matriarchs and our patriarchs, in particular our, our matriarchs, and, um, and, and you know, pay great respect uh, to to our to our mothers, our grandmothers, and that. So very important. So in uh, just a little bit of a little bit of history around the welcome to country, we know the protocol uh, varies and differs right across the country, but essentially, it's an important protocol that we all have right across the land, the Nurumbungu Dara land country, some billows of waters. And it's about uh, giving respect and honour uh, to people travelling on our country, into country, and protecting our guests on country as well, very important. And giving people authority and permission to be able to, on our country, uh, Nurembunga and Billas and Waters. So, a little bit about that. Um, our welcome to country is always made in the spirit of peace, in, in peace and a desire for harmony for all peoples of the modern ACT and surrounds. And our main aim is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post contact of this region. And as local custodians, we warmly welcome, once again, all people now living, working and visiting our ancestral country, our lands. So when Europeans first arrived on the horizon uh, in the 1820s here in the Canberra region, and just across the, the creek here, uh, Cambry Creek, which is now renamed Malongolo River and into Lake Burley Griffin. They asked our ancestors 
uh, what do you call this place? And our ancestors didn't respond by saying the barbecue area. The, the different renditions of the word Canberra came back here. Canberra is actually an, an anglicised, Romanised word. All the words here in the southeast are anglicised, Romanised, because non-Aboriginal people couldn't pronounce our ancestors ancestral words or, or took the time or the care to, to learn our language, our local language. So the different renditions of the word here you can see demonstrate that. And in language the word numbri or nambri means to sleep, the camp. So, so when our ancestors were asked uh, what do you call this place, numbri, cambri, this is where we sleep, camp. And that was at Acton Peninsula uh, where the National Museum of Australia is now, uh, IATSIS, and that's where I was born. Anyone born in Canberra? Yes, we are an endangered species. Aren't we? <laughs> There's not many of us left. So it's important we all have an identity and a belonging, very important, and with that comes our language, our new young, our language, very important. And a little bit further to the north, I'm just going to... So Cambry, Cambry Station, uh, a white fellow named JJ Moore gazetted his uh, property under the New South Wales colonial government as Cambry Station, which is now Acton Peninsula, the ANU, uh, sort of modern-day Canberra. And just an image of country here, Nalangbang, uh, Kurungbang, which is renamed, uh, European name, Yankee hat out at Namiji Gajambi. I just wanted to show you that image of country, give you a, let you look at that for a little while, so linguistics and, and, and cultural boundaries here as well. So when our ancestors first met European people, uh, a little bit up here to the north here, when Europeans come through here, Hamilton Hume, uh, into uh, southern Gundungara country, Pajong. Uh, he met our ancestors here, Walla Balawa people in Pajong. Walla Balawa, Nunawal speaking, Canberra, Wogaloo speaking, Guma, Wogaloo, Molongula, Nagarigo speaking, Manaru, and Nagarigo speaking, and a little bit over here, we got Gundungara, Darawal speaking, and Duraga speakers on the coast, and the Wiradjuri speakers here to the west. So essentially our ancestors were multilingual. All our old people, matriarchs and patriarchs were multilingual. And all the languages were mutually intelligible here. Uh, it's just naturally our people, our communication was powerful and strong. So when our ancestors first met uh, Europeans, they were asked, uh, uh, where are we? Uh, and our ancestors simply responded by saying Nunua. In language, Nunua means here, where else are we? And so the wall is an intensifier, Nunawa, Nunawa, we're here, where else are we? And it also has different meanings as well, it means on the other side. So depending where you are in the landscape, I'm Nunawa, I'm here, I'm on the other side of the hill or the creek. Uh, very important that the language uh, revival is, is being undertaken at the moment. So we, we talk about uh, a whole range of things when it comes to the welcome to country. And uh, you know that our ancestors have cared for Mother Earth uh, for s since the dawn of time, right across, not just here locally, but right across the country. And evidence of our occupation can be seen right throughout the land. And our signature is in the land, uh, not just our DNA. And taking care of country is important to us. Uh, the more we look after the land and the rivers, the more they look after us. I just want to share. So our key totems here in the southeast include the Mullion, uh, Eagle, Eagle Hawk also the Umbay, the Yukon Brook, the Crow. And these creation dream time stories are right here on country and uh, also powerful up in the Brindabellas or the Gondawaras, the Namiji and the Gajambis. There's an image of my great-great-grandfather, Henry Williams, Gubra, and he, he lived in Campton country. Uh, he was born, born in about 1837 out of Namiji, Gajambi here, and lived and worked for non-Aboriginal people and... and uh, worked hard along with his matriarchs as well. So they, uh, they were able to live in two worlds. They straddled the two worlds of uh, European and their own world, uh, Aboriginal world, local country, and were able to adapt and learn to live uh, with non-Aboriginal people, uh, the colonisers. So, so we know a lot about our ancestors, and, 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 and with that, we know a lot about our ancestors because of the, uh, the ethno-historical records, and they exist in places like the National Library here, and IATSIS. But here, uh, the National Library, is a, we're able to open up a door and, and look back in time at uh, a lot of our history, but we just don't rely on the ethno-historical records either. We have our own oral histories and, and our country, uh, our footprint on country that 
shares and tells a story. And it's about, about the, uh, that respect and acknowledgement and honouring our old people. And we all fight hard when we get back home on our own country to earn, uh, to fight for our ancestors' recognition and that acknowledgement and honouring. We all do that, not just as Aboriginal people, Indigenous Australians, but also as non-Aboriginal people. So just quickly some images of family and country here at Kapa Cumberlong uh, on the Murrumbidgee. Uh, I could talk a little bit more about family and country, but as you can see, we, we work hard uh, since the day we were born here on country to, um, to acknowledge our, our link and connection and to you know, promote ourselves as Aboriginal people because if we don't, uh, non-Aboriginal people are simply not going to do it for us from Capitol Hill or on Currajong Hill. So, and the message to the politicians on Capitol Hill is Butangariala language, and that means to speak the truth. And that message we send to uh, Capitol Hill, unfortunately the politicians and some of the bureaucrats don't quite listen to us. And we're working hard to uh, you know, educate uh, a lot of non-Aboriginal people and ourselves on the journey of that respect and honouring and acknowledgement. So an image of my, my mother Matilda, I'd like to acknowledge my mother Matilda um, as my matriarch and my great grandmother, great great grandmother there, Violet, and all our ancestors in country, my grandfather Doug, uh, uh, my ancestors here, Babu Fred Freeman, uh, any, any descendants of the Freeman family here uh, from Brungle, uh, my great great grandfather there and great great grandmother. Uh, Bobby Fred Freeman, Sarah Broughton. Bobby Fred lived to 105, and he he drank. His secret was black tea, <laughs> black tea and tobacco. <laughs> and he was able. He walked all over country and uh, to 105. Amazing, you know. Um, and so, uh, along with my great great grandmother there. So, country very important. Uh, the research very important. David, you mentioned that, that a lot of this research. This we've been blessed. Uh, by non-Aboriginal people as well to come and, and do some homework, a lot of research for us on country, including we produce our own primary school readers here in the ACT to tell the, the, the stories of, and the legends of our people and our links to country. Um, so the Murrumbidgee. So a little, when our ancestors first met uh, Europeans here in the region, uh, and when they saw livestock, uh, and when they saw sheep in particular, the, only, the word they gave sheep was uh, the word uh, jumbak or jumbak. And the word jumbak turned into jumbak and now is legend. And in language, uh, the only way our ancestors could des describe a sheep was with that word and it means uh, small clouds of smoke or small mist of smoke. And that word spread right across the country. And including a word some may know up north and around the country is yaraman, uh, which is horse. So when our ancestors first met uh, Europeans as well, they, when they first saw horse, they were amazed and the only way they could describe the horse was the word yiramung. So in language, yira mean teeth and mung mean big. So big teeth. <laughs> and it's an image of Yuriara, moss stone. So we talk about all the special places on country. One of these is Yuriara. Yuriara in language is running to the feast. It's where our ancestors are camped and lived uh, and cook. Uh, the Bogong Moth, uh, just out here to the west over the, the Murrumbidgee here. Image, yeah, lots of images, so Bogong, uh, our campsites are right here in uh, suburbia. Uh, we don't have to travel far, we're on country, uh, on our sites every day here on country. And canoe trees, and uh, there's a possum tree, and images of more canoe trees. So. We must remember under the concrete and the steel of our cities and towns is a rich, powerful indigenous history, a 65,000 year old history that belongs to all of us. It's a shared history. We all have responsibility in looking after. And with that, on behalf of our uh, matriarchs and patriarchs, I say Guruburi, another word that was Romanized from um, Kuruburi. Here in the southeast, the word Kuruburi uh, come from the word Guruburi. And we know uh, all these words very powerful and mean a lot to us also. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to say Wurugawuri, uh, thank you, and Gurubari, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Uh, 
great insight into the region that we're living on. And I love the phrase that we're on country every day. I, I think it reminds us um, of the beautiful country that we have here in the region. Um, and thanks for welcoming us onto your country. And I too would like to acknowledge uh, your ancestors, uh, your elders past and present, and also those emerging. And I had the opportunity to catch up with your mum yesterday, um, who always lets me know uh, what's happening in the world of politics and black politics. Um, and, and spending a minute with her is like an hour, because it actually is an hour. <laughs> but no, she's a beautiful person. Um, our next speaker uh, was actually so eager to be part of this conference that he and I were the first two people here this morning. Um, and we were locked out of this building and we were actually probably like two school children on their first day whose parents got the drop-off times wrong. Um, but it gave us a great opportunity to have a chat outside. Um, so it's my pleasure actually to, to welcome my fellow first day school student uh, who happens to also be the chair of the Council for the National Library of Australia. Please welcome the Honourable Dr Brett Mason. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, thank you, mate. Uh, thanks very much for that warm welcome. Uh, and look, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the National Library of Australia on this beautiful uh, summer's day here in, in, in Canberra. And welcome especially to those that have travelled uh, to be with us here this morning. Um, I'm Brett Mason. I chair, it's my uh, honour to chair the council of this wonderful institution, the National Library. And looking at the uh, list of distinguished conference speakers. Not only am I delighted to be here this morning, but I'm, I'm, I'm really honoured to be here this morning with you. Let me also acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. And Paul, can I thank you uh, for so warmly welcoming us to country, uh, to here. Thank you, Paul, again, thank you. Not only am I delighted to see uh, so many joining our conference language keepers preserving the indigenous language of the, of the Pacific, but also can I welcome those watching us live via Facebook live stream, uh, a new part of technology that wasn't around um, when I was at school, uh, uh, John. This conference is the, the final event, ladies and gentlemen, for the National Library's exhibition, Cook and the Pacific, which opened here last September. And for those of you that haven't yet seen the exhibition, can I encourage you to have a look at it this weekend while you still can? And you'll be joining over 100,000 visitors that have seen the exhibition and its related programs. Cook in the Pacific, our exhibition here at the National Library, aims to offer a, a different perspective on Captain Cook and the rich Pacific cultures that he met. The exhibition tells stories from Cook's three remarkable voyages through the Pacific, not only through the eyes of, of James Cook and his crew, not only through their eyes, but also through the vibrant and remarkable voices of the First Nations peoples that they encountered. And this morning, John and I were having a chat. I remember, this will date me, but I remember in 1970 at the bicentenary of James Cook's arrival on the East Coast, the story was told. Let me tell you now, the story is told in this exhibition in a very different way than it was told in 1970. A key component of these stories are the word lists recorded on Cook's voyages, which are invaluable sources for historians and for First Nations peoples. What they show is that despite all the difficulties in communicating, all those difficulties, people sought to come together, they tried to make themselves understood and they tried to understand each other. These word lists are just a small example of the many documents and the many recordings held by cultural organisations across our region which are proving invaluable today in assisting communities in, of Australia and indeed throughout the Pacific in revitalising their languages and in so doing strengthening cultures, strengthening Pacific cultures and Aboriginal cultures, and also cultural healing. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of this weekend, this conference aims to highlight the work being undertaken in cultural, in academic, and community sectors to preserve languages. 
And while we will hear that there is still much work to be done, uh, and there is, this conference will celebrate many examples of revitalising language in Australia and the Pacific, acknowledging the important work being undertaken by organisations and communities. I must, uh, as Chair of the Council of the National Library of Australia, acknowledge that the Cook and the Pacific, this wonderful exhibition, would not have been possible without the support of individuals, communities, cultural institutions, sponsors and government. And on behalf of the National Library, may I thank each and every one of them. The National uh, Library of Australia acknowledges the, gen the generous contribution of First Nations peoples who have allowed, who have allowed their culture, their experiences and their voices to be heard right throughout this exhibition. Can we also acknowledge the support of lending institutions, domestic and also overseas, by sharing their history and collections with us? Uh, we will build stronger connections uh, with communities and those whose lives that we represent. And also, uh, I should also thank the government for providing significant funding, including through the National Collecting Institution's Turing Outreach Program. And finally, we are very grateful, the National Library, for the financial and the in-kind support provided by our generous exhibition partners, ActuAGL, the Pratt Foundation, the Kenyon Foundation, and Foxtel's History Channel. Ladies and gentlemen, this weekend's Language Keepers Conference is not only the final event for the Cook and the Pacific Exhibition, but also the first of several events planned to mark UNESCO's 2019 International Year of Indigenous Peoples, of Ind Indigenous Languages. We are very pleased, in fact, we're delighted that UNESCO has allowed us to promote this conference this weekend as a standalone event in the 2019 International Year of Indigenous Languages. This is the first, today is the first of several events related to Indigenous languages that the Library plans to offer this year, furthering UNESCO's goal of promoting, of promoting, revitalising and preserving Indigenous languages. And ladies and gentlemen, we are very lucky today, we're very lucky this morning because we have with us Sue Moore, Secretary General of the Australian National Commission for UNESCO, who will tell us about UNESCO's 2019 International Year of Indigenous Languages. Before I go, finally, um, ladies and gentlemen, in the National Library of Australia, in, in your National Library, we seek, we seek to collect Australia's stories. And we seek to hold our nation's memory. And I look forward, I'm sure we all look forward this weekend to hearing more of those stories. With that, ladies and gentlemen, would you please, wel please join me in welcoming Sue Moore and all the very best for your weekend in the National Library and in Canberra. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brett. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you very much for this opportunity to provide some opening remarks during the International Year of Indigenous Languages. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal people, and would like to take the opportunity to do so in Ngunnawal language, as recently taught to be by Ngunnawal custodian and descendant, Mr. Tyrone Bell, who joins us here today. Thawa Nuna Thawa Nunawo, Yangu Gulanyin Nalawiri, Dunai Nanawal Thawa, Wongaliri Nien, Maran Balan Bhagavan. This is Nanawal country. Today we are all sitting and talking on Nanawal country. We are always listening to the senior men and women. On behalf of the Australian National Commission for UNESCO, I congratulate the National Library on convening this very important conference. 
The Australian government strongly welcomed the decision by the United Nations General Assembly actually in 2017 to proclaim 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Languages. And the General Assembly referred to the critical loss of Indigenous languages and the urgent need to preserve, revitalise and promote them, as Brett has said. The UN identified an as an important goal of the year, mainstreaming the knowledge and values of Indigenous people and cultures within broader societies. It asked all member states of the UN to take quote unquote urgent steps at both national and international levels. And it tasked UNESCO to be the lead agency for the year. As you all know, a person's freedom of thought, a freedom to use his or her chosen language is a prerequisite for freedom of thought, freedom of opinion and freedom of expression, and many other values that are enshrined in the International and Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And linguistic diversity is also important in achieving quality education for all, which is a key objective for UNESCO, building inclusive language and knowledge societies, and preserving cultural and documentary heritage. Those three areas happen to be the key pillars of Australia's engagement with UNESCO. So the Australian National Commission for UNESCO serves three roles. Firstly, to advise the Australian government on all matters relating to UNESCO. Secondly, and in my view, very importantly, to provide a portal for the Australian community to access UNESCO's programs and policies and to help implement UNESCO's mandate in Australia. And thirdly, to foster and support UNESCO's programs and goals in Australia. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade hosts the Secretariat for the Commission, and we work very closely with our permanent delegation to UNESCO at our embassy in Paris. The Australian National Commission is committed to supporting and celebrating the International Year of Indigenous Languages, and it's one of our key priorities for the year. And we're doing this through activities and partnerships which we hope will forge meaningful improvements to the understanding and preservation of Indigenous languages in Australia and in the Pacific region. And we also seek to promote a conversation within Indigenous and um, non-Indigenous communities on the significance of Indigenous languages to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Through listening to the enormous expertise in this room over the next two days. We will hear the extent of the erosion of Indigenous languages and will no doubt lament what we've lost. But this conference is so timely um, as a key step to energising our efforts to revive, reconstruct and preserve those languages for the benefit of future generations. So UNESCO developed a plan of action for this year and while it's long, if you care to look at the UNESCO website, it actually provides a great um, entry point and a range of ways in which countries can embrace the year. So we hope that the year will serve as a catalyst for building Australians' knowledge of and appreciation for the intrinsic role that Indigenous languages play in the identity and sustainability of Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples and Pacific Island Indigenous communities. All Australians benefit from reviving and maintaining Indigenous languages. Embedded in languages are not only people's history, traditions, memory and unique modes of expression, but the futures of individuals and communities. These are constructed through language. UNESCO recognised that there was an urgent need to enhance the intergenerational transmission of Indigenous language. We believe um, in supporting closely UNESCO's mainstream of Indigenous languages as an important step to achieving Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm delighted also to convey here to delegates greetings from Ms Nisho, who's the Director of Office and UNESCO representative to Pacific States based in Apia, Samoa. So the Australian National Commission collaborates with UNESCO Pacific Office and national commissions across the Pacific to support UNESCO's work in our region. Promoting the Indigenous knowledge um, in sustainable development is a core priority for UNESCO in the Pacific and some of the examples of work they're doing include in Nauru, um, UNESCO's supporting educational activities to celebrate mother tongue 
curriculum and teaching practices are being revised in Palau and Niue to integrate traditional language and knowledge systems. And in Samoa, UNESCO is supporting inter-school literacy and numeracy activities in traditional languages. By strengthening knowledge and the use of Indigenous languages in the Pacific, we help build resilient, empathetic and culturally fluent young people better able to navigate the development challenges of the 21st century. UNESCO, as you may know, was founded by education ministers in the 1940s, very soon after the end of World War II. The founders were so horrified by the ravages of war that they vowed to create a multinational agency dedicated to building peace through education. This mission remains at the core of UNESCO today. The freedom to pursue knowledge and the importance of being able to freely share that knowledge both speak to that mission of peace. Language is pivotal to the pursuit of knowledge and we all benefit from linguistic diversity. So arresting the decline of precious Indigenous languages of Australia and the Pacific and accelerating their preservation is the task that we've been set. I wish you the very best for these discussions. Shan Yamaba, thank you. Thank you, thank you Sue and thank you Brett uh, for welcoming us to the National Library. Um, I think 2019 is gonna be a great year for Indigenous languages. It's gonna help uh, this country, I think, build on the momentum uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages have been uh, experiencing over many decades. Um, but it's also going to assist, I think, in maintaining that momentum uh, for the next couple of decades. On this day, 250 years ago, the Endeavour, after clearing Cape Horn a few days earlier, was tracking northwest. And it was heading for the Te Aumotu Archipelago and Tahiti. It was the 9th of February, 1769. Cook wrote in his journal, fresh gales all this day, sometimes squally with rain, wind southerly, course north 55 degrees west. Banks, who had come out of his cabin on a rare occasion, wrote, this morn, some seaweed floated past the ship and my servant declares that he saw a large beetle fly over my head. Ahead for the endeavour lay five weeks of the Pacific before reaching the archipelago in early April. The words and language of the Cooks and Banks and others journals were the work and the life aboard the endeavour. But importantly, what was to come would capture the world's rich diversity of culture, of language, of indigenous peoples that would change the course of the Pacific and this country forever. Our next speaker is someone who has also helped change the course of this country through his work as one of our most celebrated writers. He is a multi-award winning Noongar author. He grew up in Albany in southern Western Australia and worked as a secondary school teacher before turning to full-time writing. In 2000, he became the first Indigenous author to win the Miles Franklin Literary Award with his novel, Benang, From the Heart. In 2011, he won both the Miles Franklin Award and the Australian Literature Society's Gold Medal with That Dead Man Dance. Since completing a PhD in creative writing at the University of West Australia, in 2009, he's been involved in the Curtin Health Innovation Research Institute and also the Willoman Noongar Language and Story Project. In 2012, he was made a Fellow of the Australian Academy for Humanities and was also named West Australian of the Year. He is currently a Professor of Writing in the School of Media, Culture and Creative Arts at the Curtin University. It gives me great pleasure and please welcome Professor Kim Scott. Thank you for being here 
so early in the day and the weekend. Um, thanks particularly to Paul for welcoming us in that way. It is a delight and my heart smiles to be welcomed in that way. Uh, and I'm using Nunga in, in reply. So thank you, Paul. It's a challenge to follow such eloquent speakers. Um, I'll do the best I can. I need to warn you beforehand that I'll be using names and images of family and community members who've passed away. I've been at their funerals where we speak their names and show their images. And I say that as much to, to mark regional authenticity, if you like, but it still might be awkward for, for, for some others. That said, I wonder if I'm not a little bit out of place here, in fact, as grateful as I am for the invitation. Indigenous languages of the Pacific. Mine, my most ancient local and ancestral tongue, is to the west of here, of course, toward the setting sun and the Indian Ocean, and then down a bit. It's the Southern Ocean, in fact, really, a thin strip of land along the bottom of the continent, at the edge of the Southern continent. And it's the language, that ancient language from there that I'll be talking about rather than using in a forum like today. Nunga language, or Nunga as some say. And in fact, it's a subset of that, a, a, a version, a dialect of that larger language, the Willeman Noongar language. And it's a long way from home to be talking about indigenous language. Worse, if you like, I'm a novelist, not a linguist, as so many of the people involved are over this weekend. And thus, in a vocational sense, I'm here as an amateur, really, an enthusiast, if you like. But let me tell you, and I hope this will be revealed as I speak today, I am deeply committed to much more than the preservation of my own ancestral tongue, but the revivification of it, and uh, strong enough so that it can adapt and move into the future. So I want to begin today by telling, by talking, and much of this will be personal rather than rigorously academic and giving you an overview, but it's quite a small area I'm speaking from. But I want to talk something of my own motivation over a, a life journey and as a lover of language generally. Some years ago, as you've already heard, I was the first Aboriginal novelist to, win, to be awarded the Miles Franklin, a big literary award. And that was for Bernung. It's a Noongar word, Bernung. The novel itself uses the language of Western Australia's official archives, the language in the libraries there. And particularly, I'll only leave this on a little bit. Particularly a book, Australia's Coloured Minority, Its Place in the Community, by a fellow who was a chief bureaucrat for a number of decades. Uh, uses the language of race. And it's Australia's Coloured Minority, Its Place in the Community. In fact, what it offers is no, no place. So Benung, which I'll get back to that, Benung was a way of responding to that encounter with a particular construction of our shared history. And it's a work of deconstruction of sorts, turning that language or attempting to turn that language back on itself. 
Because, as I've said, Australia's coloured minority, that book, and in fact so much in the language of the archives, the language of our shared history, there was no place offered. Educating people into shame of their heritage, their background, including emphatically their language, and offered, in fact, no place other than turning themselves into white people. In that photo, you may remember, I won't go back to it, they are in a line, they have their backs to one another. Some visual gesture at progress, as if they're marching to the future. Bear none, that Noongar word, means tomorrow. It's a word from the deep past of southwest Australia. The last word in that novel using the language of the archives, is Benham. We are still here, Benham. At the end of the novel, the narrator, pale, scarred, damaged, hovers in the campfire smoke and makes sounds that are not given in the book, but that are indisputably of place, despite the initial scepticism of the audience he's gathering around him. I thought, in my little way, it was a metaphor for Indigenous language, his utterances drawing people to him, bringing, firstly, his own community together around those sounds. And I guess I was thinking about, or maybe I was just wishing for, language recovery being about rebuilding community and continuity and a sense of place, being about identity and belonging, or something like that. Using the official language of our history, the archives, as a Noongar person seemed like being caught in a trap. As much as I also love the English language, but it was, and I was having to use that same language if it was a trap to take it apart, to escape it. But that sort of deconstruction can only take you so far, I think. You need some other nourishing source to draw on, to connect with. You remember that image, the three people in a line, no place. They stand in their line, backs to one another. But imagine if they were to turn around and start talking in their ancestral indigenous tongue. Perhaps... Without Benang, there's no tomorrow for the people in that photograph. Now, talking like this, I want to say emphatically that language is not the sole indicator of Aboriginal identity. And I'm speaking personally. There's much other that forms identity. But for me, it's important. And I think even engagement with one's ancestral tongue the very business of attempting to recover and rebuild it is a big factor in identity for me. After Bernung, and you'll excuse, I'm, I thought this may seem like an exercise in shameless promotion, self-promotion, but I'm giving a little journey here. I'm trying to be uh, sincere. After Bernung and a little bit of a crisis from the success that came from it, I wrote a book with my most significant cultural elder, Aunty Hazel Brown, Kayan Hazel Brown, over the course of which she offered me her language resources, her memory, her tongue, even some notes she'd made with her father as she tended him in his dying years, and told me that he was worried when she wrote down Noongar words. It's a different time, how rapidly things have changed. He was worried because of what it might meant for him and the family to be retaining that language. But also in Kayung and me, there's very little Noongar language in that book other than the title, Kayung, meaning elder, significant elder, auntie. I want to read a little bit from this book. And it will be in English, not in Noongar language, as a way of further explaining motivation 
for recovering ancestral tongue. It's a little anecdote Auntie Hazel offered me. Starts off with her going hunting, duck hunting. She lists the names of everyone that was there, which is a characteristic of her yarns. And they're in a utility, in a ute. So it's in the contemporary world, but it refers to a much deeper past. Her voice, something like this. Anyways, we got right in the swamp. Fresh water got right up there close. And just before we get toward where the old camps were, Daddy said, you've got to stop here now and make a fire. You've got to make smoke and let them know you're coming. So he cleared the ground and then he got a little bit of dry grass and he dug a hole and he lit a fire. Well, we had to be very careful because it was summertime and we didn't have any water. The fire burned up and he chucked some green bushes on and then the smoke, see, soon as the smoke went up, well, you should have heard the curlews, hear them singing out. They're singing out over there and there on this side all around us. And you know, when they make that noise and you're not used to it, that willow cry can be very frightening. I was amazed, you know. We just stood there and we looked at one another, how they made a noise all around us. Well, we looked at one another, me and Tommy, we were scared. Shivers went up and down my back. Daddy said, that's it, you're right. That's the Willowman people letting us know. We're right now. And he just hit the two sticks together like that and no more. We heard him, but we didn't see one. That's something I'll always remember, you know, when we heard them all around us. It was just like a chorus, like a lot of Noongars, they think, oh, a death bird, you know. But not us, not we Willowmen. They speak to us. Willowang mayawang, like in that song. And then she sang a fragment of this song. You see? That's something impossible to find in the official archives when I went looking for family history. I guess it was. This was, you had in that little anecdote, you have a specific site in country. You have something like ceremony, if not in fact ceremony, you have song in an ancestral language. Now, very few of Kai Young Hazel's generation remain. She's still with us, 90 something. They, but they are the people who kept our people's name alive in hostile colonial times. And I've been to that place, the Hunter River. But what I like in this story, that story of hers is this, one's people, speaking from another realm, heard but not seen, wrapped in smoke and darkness, just their voices all around you in a shifting world. And in a way, this is what I want to speak about today, Willem and Noongar language and story. We get together regularly, call them workshops, and listen to mouth the sounds of our old people. It's small, it's a small thing. I don't know how it translates to some sort of national narrative. There's no building we're in. There's no offices. It's provincial. We've been operating together in this sort of focused way as a group of volunteers mainly. A little bit of research funding feeding into it for over 10 years. It's a bunch of people who trust one another which may not all be, always be the case, I fear, when you're nourishing or attempting to nourish an ancestral language where there's been efforts to crush it and now it's beginning to be celebrated and desired even by newer arrivals to the place. This shift that we've already referred to, uh, even in this narrative of Cook. This is a photo from taken after one of the workshops, Willem and Noongar Language and Stories workshops, this little, what's become a little not-for-profit cultural organisation to pump, cop to own the copyright for what we're doing. 
It started around the turn of the century. As I've said, no funding, volunteers, just a little clan and friends. It's now got about 100 members. Um, we stopped at 100 because uh, I, I at least started to realise all the work involved we were loading ourselves with to be communicating officially with that number of people. So it's more involved in with it than that. It's not primarily about teaching. It's not pedagogical teaching or learning Noongar language, though that's a component, but it wants to return and consolidate a particular classical indigenous cultural heritage with an emphasis on language, story and song in its home community and to empower its members by sharing it, by sharing this major denomination in the currency of identity and belonging. I'll use that phrase quite a bit today if I can. And by being together in its sound, the name Willeman represents a communal identity, a group with ancestry and connections to a wide area of southern WA. This may be a little bit too detailed in this context from about Cape Rich to east of Esperance. It intersects with territory specified in the Tyndale maps, Korang, Wudjuri and Nyunga. And there's other names also applied across this area. I didn't grow up speaking the Noongar language, handful of words only. It's an endangered language, like many Aboriginal languages across the continent. How endangered depends how you define language. Do you mean it has to be intact in its classical vocab and structure as a language system? Do you mean it has to be distinct enough, uh, distinctive enough to be an identity marker in various ways? Does it need to be strong enough to offer insights and perspectives into another way of seeing, another way of being? Does it need to be widespread enough to posture? Does it need to be widespread enough to show resilience? Does it contrast enough with standard English? There's a whole bunch of ways. Interestingly enough, does it need to be widespread? And Paul already talked about the word Canberra. Does the language need to be widespread enough to inform contemporary regional vernacular, place names, plant and animal names, objects? Noongar certainly is. And you could argue that everyone in the southwest, as soon as they read a map, in a way, is speaking Noongar language but we needed it to be better than that, I, I would argue. The census says something like this, tiny numbers speaking Noongar in the home. I think this reminds us of the context of endangered languages, the decimation of the population in which they originate because of colonisation, a minority surviving the first decades people being punished for speaking language, people educated into shame. We forget this these days, I think. Along with the destruction of a unique natural environment in the case of every Aboriginal language, which has so many reference for that language. And it, as I said, it depends on how you define language. What I want you to notice in this graph is not the numbers, but the increase. It's increasing. So the Willem and Noongar language and stories mob relies very much on these people, custodians of language that have, irrespective of the work I attempt to do, the scholarly work with archives and so on and marrying it back to community. These are people who kept not only the name of a mob of us alive that didn't come through in paperwork except in a scanty way, but also their tongues operating in the right sort of way, themselves as instruments for this manifestation of spirit, this ancient manifestation of spirit. I'll return to these wonderful people. We've published six books inspired by archival material and by stories in a community repertoire copyright and royalties go back in the little organisation we've set up. And we've done performances of stories and song at schools and festivals. The books, I love books, 
but these are really just a vehicle more than an end in themselves, in fact. I'm a little disappointed in that, but that's how it works. They allow multiple people to move to what I'd call the cross-cultural cusp. As authors, illustrators, presenters, performers, experts on what we're doing. And books help provide a focus and a validation. We've also got a website, um, audio there of stories being read aloud, members of our community, audio of vocab, pictures of activities and workshops. Exp we're experimenting with password protected sections for various reasons. But it's the gathering together around ancestral language, story and song that feels most important. As I've said, making ourselves instruments of it. And in so doing, having to reshape ourselves from the inside out to, to be a vehicle for these sounds. So we started with senior members of the Wheelerman clan in the 90s. So this is people from the south coast of WA. Early 90s, partly as, as elsewhere, given a jolt by native title stuff, partly generated by the long process of getting that book together, Kai Young and me. So, but it was elders wanting to organise, realising the need to organise their heritage and control it more than preserve it, make it real and something not just held in various bureaucracies evolving. Along with the personal material from the elders and many of the people in here, not just elders, uh, a particular archive, the Gerhard Laves, I think that's how you say his name, 1931 Noongar language field notes have made a big contribution to what we're doing. This was material sent by the family of a linguist back in 1930 in Australia, was held in the States until late last century, got back here. IATSIS, under the jurisdiction of IATSIS, 2006 IATSIS, the University of Western Australia and a reference group of Noongar people, including descendants, and this is a really important thing, I think, descendants of the informants to that linguist established a protocol for the return of that material to its community of origin. The reference group articulated that they wanted to return the material to a community descended from those informants, to a lot of people, not just themselves, and bring it under control might be the word, or jurisdiction, bring it back. A significant subset of the reference group wanted more than that because there's a danger we, for reasons more complex than we can explain here in this short time that it exacerbates rivalry over access to that cultural material in its home community. It exacerbates tensions like that. They wanted to find a way to get it back, consolidate it and bring it alive by sharing it systematically and cleverly. These people are really important to that. I want to name them, though we're a long way from home. Helen Hall, Lomas Roberts, Simon Williams, Gerald Williams, I mean, Hazel Brown, to whom I'm deeply indebted, Audrey Brown. Aunty Ying, Helen, on uh, the left, her dad spoke to the linguist in 1930s. Uncle Lomas, his uncle, spoke to the linguist. And he knew, called them all, all these people called these people uncle, if not father. In the middle, that dapper gentleman, Gerald Williams, his dad, Simon Williams, and so on. Arnie Ying, Arnie Hazel, Arnie Audrey Brown. Uh, Nobby Brown was the informant there. Arnie Ying, though, interestingly, I thought, she died, her dad died when she was just a toddler, so she never learned the language or heard him, much of him speaking it. So it was psychically, psychologically difficult for her early on when we started bringing it alive. And all the more joyous when we had some success 
which though I'm running out of time, I'll try and speak of a little more. Recently, we've started working with uh, another archive, uh, a fellow called Von Brandenstein, um, song, which seems to work better than books, in my little opinion. So again, as part of that project, we've um, created little, uh, so we get a bunch of people together. Um, I, I, we'll get to this later. We've got the, it says custodians, Henry Dapp, Annie Dapp. They're the children of Charlie and his brother, Sammy Dapp, so nephew and niece in that case. We get them together to control who they want to first start learning these songs. And it's, a, it's been an 18-month process to us to memorise them and learn them and have an idea what they're about and to be able to sing them and perform them. We also work, uh, here's a quote from a man who's joined our cultural elders reference group, the sort of terms you use in these instances, who more recently, having been invited to one of our workshops, gave us some songs. And it's amazing you can have a man speaking so frankly as what he's saying there. And also such a great honour. And then we invite, they, they invite who they want along to these workshops as we try and bring them alive. These are people that remained after a weekend workshop and they've helped us clean up and some of them, most of them jump on a bus to head back to further areas. The Willeman process works a bit like this. I'm attempting to diagram this and impress you with the rigour and our planning. Another way of putting it might be just be ripples extending out from this core group, this centre, to wider and wider audiences and then back again and then expanding out with the, as we, a sort of a drip feed. So, but it's about... It's about consolidating it first in a home community and then being empowered through sharing it. And I'll try and indicate that. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. This is sort of how we started. Uh, and I'll, I'll show, this is over 10 years or so, workshops of both stories and songs, how we work with it. And I'll try and riff just by showing you images rather than reading my notes here. But the first time we gathered together with the Love's notes, it was memorable to me. It speaks of the emotional intensity of some of this work. We had something like 60 people there. We first of all attempting to rebuild a sense of ceremony about this sort of thing, invited individuals, ones like the ones I've already shown in those earlier photographs and others, key descendants, invited them out in front of a group of all Noongar people to be presented with the linguist's work, material, from their dad, uncle, whatever. Ones, twos, threes, people came out and they spoke. But even before we did that, just within the first few minutes of gathering and starting to get formal, everyone in the room was crying. And I don't know... It was something to do with, as everyone said, we only get together like this for funerals these days. But I like to sense it was something to do with this reconnection, the voices of people that we couldn't see, but we were bringing their voices back. The, the nurturing, the nourishment, the sacredness of it. I know that sounds a bit new agey, but uh, we were all crying. And then we moved into giving them back, and some of us said, we've got some ideas for what we might want to do with that material, if you want. And then we started with two or three of those paper stories in the international phonetic alphabet that only one or two of us had taught ourselves to read good enough. We did this sort of thing. The children of the informant sitting around, I attempted to read them aloud. This is what the paperwork looks like, hundreds of pages of it name of an informant at the top, could track him down, the children down from that, funny alphabet. And it's not even all correctly translated. This is a really interesting thing with reading it aloud to key people 
and that doesn't seem right. Um, there's a couple of examples on this page which we won't worry with now. Whittle has got it wrong, he's translated it wrong, and we picked that up. And that's really rewarding and shows the value, the value adding of bringing oral traditions and paperwork together rather than opposing them. This is reading them aloud and the people sitting around, an inner circle and an outer circle, part of the psychic negotiating the psychology and the emotional intensities of this. Me attempting to read them aloud, people correcting me with enthusiasm, it must be said, and remembering the speakers and remembering other stories and we record all that. So that helps you build up a story that you think is going to work for those wider audiences. And we, early on, the first few years, we'd write them out in, on butcher's paper rather than present them digitally and put them on the ground just to break up sort of hierarchies or some sense of power structures that operate in something like a classroom, which doesn't work in these contexts. Um, more recent years, different ways we do it. I wanted to show this because we are using computers and screens if people are getting more comfortable with the process and we've got a wider range of ages and generations starting to kick in and buy in in different sorts of ways. It's an evolving sort of thing. Once we've got some sort of text together and to continue exploring and drafting them, then we start doing pictures for them. This is the benefit of doing books. Um, and these few shots are of people doing that. And it's made more comfortable way to explore an endangered language if you might, as I do myself, sometimes feel insecure at working with it. And we sit around and we, what's going on here? And we make the sounds and we, this is how I see it. And uh, end up then with a sort of booklet. Also, same way with songs, we listen to the old recordings, we work out what's going on on paper, talk about it, how do we want this to go, talk about how the language has changed. Had Arnie Hazel one time say, I read something from these old archives in the phonetic alphabet, and she said, oh, we used to say it like that. So what she was saying was, and I've seen some of her vocab in the old dictionaries as archaic, they say. So people carry a language and they are prepared and let it change because that's what happens as you move it around. So same with songs. And as I said, with the songs, we worked out a little like a karaoke thing, a little video that you can download. People can download phone to phone so you don't need to use an app and the uh, lack of control that comes with the big worldwide you know, access like that. And you don't have to have internet access. Um, you don't even have to have phone credit. You just download it one to one so it goes person to person to so utilize organic sort of networks for sharing it. Your name, in doing this, you have the name of the person who kept it alive for us. You have the name of the people who are looking after it and sharing it. Uh, we have the lyrics written up in spelling that could change. Um, and then we start also on occasions in these workshops, we start to play with writing other songs in Noongar language using existing tunes sometimes, sometimes radically playing with um, those old songs under the control of the custodians. I'm going to speed up a lot now. I've only got a few minutes to go if we want question time. So we're moving into dance, early days of that. I like this photo. One stage, we hand out draft copies of our books to the wider sections of the Noongar community to bring in, I suppose it's rival families or factions that may feel excluded. But this one is lovely, the two kids who never heard their dad speaking, the dad's photo in the background, They've published a book and illustrated it with their dad's story. Uh, generations now reconnecting with that. We go into schools. This is the uh, Willem and Wiggles, as I like to say. <laughs> In schools, 
something interesting happens. I'm jumping from my notes now to speed up. You find a lot of us are accustomed to being at the margins of institutions like schools. You find by bringing in this material, and there's a bunch of us, as you see, elders and a couple of us experienced in doing stuff like schools, youngsters who are not. Um, sometimes even the elders won't speak for s several days until they get the hang of it. But we go in as a group. The elders there are able to connect up kids with their families, and often that's a really important thing. And with that language, uh, this is Aunty Ying. She took a week before she'd speak, uh, and then she blossomed. So she's speaking about her dad and the stories and the songs. Uh, this is the connecting up, the building. This is part of building community around sound. We started with the songs. This was at a musicologist conference recently. 18 months work and then we sing them aloud there. Um, and these are some of these, half of these people haven't performed at all for a public. We, this is a shot taken where one of the songs was recorded, Bandy Creek, Bandy Creek, near Esperance, with uh, the fellow in the blue shirt, the son um, on the right sitting down. It's Henry Dab, Annie Dab, his sister, the children. 20 years ago, I said to Uncle Henry, hey, listen to this. And he said, you understand that? And I said, not yet. And now we're singing them. And where their dad recorded them. This is a shot that I used before on the Southern Ocean. Place names around this area, like in English, Starvation Harbour, Mount Misery, Lake Disappointment, the Barren Ranges. We've taken, and it's Massacre, what's known as Massacre Country. Some of the old land inquiries talk about it being depopulated very coy of them. It's environmentally devastated except for a little national park. In that area, we've taken a creation story back and reunited it with its landscape, these slopes. A story about dogs leaping through fire, rolling into the ocean, turning into seals, Tortbalkut, and illustrated by Aunty Ying, who, as I said before, She's only recovered these stories through the workshops. Otherwise, would never have heard them. This is a bunch of us in so-called massacre country, going on, being invited on to a farm at the centre of the massacre story and being shown sights on that country, rock holes with a slab still over them. Pretty interesting negotiation going on when you're doing that. Uh, I'll skip over this. So, so far, I think I'm, I'm getting at, I'm hinting at health well-being. Most of you would know this stuff. There's a whole lot of research. I'll just whip through. Hopefully, some of you might see your names down the bottom that indicate how important this work is to the health and well-being of Aboriginal people. I'm going to go a little bit over time here and how this sort of business offers a narrative of our shared history that's not guilt and victimhood or not polemic but is powerful for we have survived, we have reconnected, we are rebuilding, we are still here. Ben, but it's not just Aboriginal people, and this is why I need a little bit more time, this business of identity and belonging that it gives us. At those workshops, I said, we hand out the draft copies to the Noongar community. I thought I was being shrewd and politically astute, saying only to Noongars will rebuild. My elders, and you saw some of them in the photo before, I'm an old man, but these are cultural elders and they're older, luckily for me said, invite along so-and-so. I haven't checked this with him, so I won't use the name. But a member of one of the pioneering families in our ancestral country. I said, no way in the world. They stole our country. 
you live like slaves on their property for most of your life. This is going to make us, this is, this is about identity and belonging. They're going to need this and we're going to make ourselves strong by sharing it with them bit by bit. Sorry to speak so brutally there. So don't, don't, no, no, we're not having him here. But they, uh, they won the argument. So when we're asking significant, wise Noongar people representing different families up to the front, ceremoniously give them, here's a story from our old people. We want you to have it, share it with your mob. This fellow comes up in front of us all. And when he came up to the front, he's, the, oh, the other reason the, the elders said, invite him was he speaks a bit of Noongar language too, you know, Kim, and he grew up with us, even with the power relationship there. When he came up to the front to get his little package, he spoke in a little bit in Noongar language saying, I'm a bit deaf, I don't un my tongue doesn't work properly and was very proud of himself. And when he went back to sit in the audience, he was crying. Now that, it seemed, was a lesson for me in transformation. The paradox of him, empowerment through giving, is what I call it. The transformation of a power relationship. We were powerful there. He is crying because of he feels connected to us, an oppressed community, and our sense of identity and belonging. This is a quote. I'll let you read it because I'm rushing and I'm overdue already. Talking about what might be offered us through that, something like that. That's a naive and simple little yarn, it's a little bringing together a different type of culture in this country. I think this illustrates it. In Masca country, a bunch of people having negotiated with the farm owner to go back and reconnect in the most hostile of historical circumstances. The same area has a memorial to that massacre. I want to thank Carol Pettis and Ronnie Forrest, two significant Noongar women arranging that, um, and non-Aboriginal people in that area. Langu Noongar language text there. Auntie Hazel taking us to the, in the middle of devastated country, to a site, a text for a story that talks about resurrection, a moon story. So finally, I'm talking here, I think, about Aboriginal languages being a major denomination in the currency of identity and belonging. I use that financial metaphor to abbreviate my many words here because we need to invest in these things and we need to be clever with the exchange of them. Because as we move from a time of denigration of Aboriginal languages and heritage into celebration, I don't want home communities of Aboriginal people to be left behind. I don't want to be living in an area where it might be me or one of my brothers, one of us high-flying types, bringing a bunch of tourists to our ancestral country and showing them sights and giving them language when my brothers wearing the ancestors, wearing the legacy of oppression, haven't reconnected with that language and haven't been healed in those ways. If I may, these are reasons why we need to revisit things like the Uluru Statement and work out an infrastructure for these relationships, for identity and belonging in a different way. And I want to finish very quickly here is a text collected by Daisy Bates from a time long ago, a Noongar woman talking about her people out near in my ancestral country, talking about her men being chained up, taken to Albany, King Georgetown, it was known for as a time, to be taken to island prisons. Nganang Demanga Kichin Mia, born in Warabin, King Georgetown. I like this text because it has a, a frame of Noongar language within which a colonial place name is contained. 
This is from when we were much stronger than we are now. Our me and my old people, our eyes like spears cutting through the bush toward King Georgetown where things are becoming bad. I'd like to think we can in this beginning of a new era utilise our Aboriginal languages to anchor a shimmering nation state, a shimmering settler colony to this ancient continent through its languages, through its home communities, so that we can be in a position to be saying in many languages all over the continent, things are getting better now. Quap a bit. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. No, we got. I'm easy, whatever way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful and uh, stunning and personal presentation uh, to kickstart some amazing discussions. Thank you very much for uh, sharing the story and your story. Um, I let Kim go over time for a couple of reasons because he is such a magnificent speaker, and I felt it important that we hear the fullness of his presentation. Um, and also, I'd probably get in trouble if I, I, I stop you talking. So we've only got time for a couple of questions before we go to morning tea. Um, but Kim's going to be here all day, so there's opportunity to have a morning tea and lunch, of course, to grab him and ask him a couple of questions. And we'll have a session this afternoon uh, with a couple of other speakers where we can have a Q&A session and uh, unpack some of the great issues that you raised in that. So um, we've probably got time for just a, a handful of questions. Has anyone got any burning questions that they want to ask Kim now? that they can't ask him after a, after a cup of tea. I could speak more. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, maybe as a way of concluding, Kim, I, I, I'd, I'd be keen to ask uh, you a question about um, how Indigenous languages can, and you, you pointed to this at the end of your presentation, is what would you tell non-Indigenous people in the nation of what Indigenous languages can do in terms of getting them to have a greater appreciation of this continent, of this country? and a greater connection to the history of this country um, to maybe overcome some of the fears or apprehensions they have about Indigenous languages? Yeah, well, some of the benefits, if that's part of the question, I think, is I'm, I went through those place names before and then did the contrast. That's a different way of being, a different way of belonging. That's what it opens up. Uh, the fear, overcoming the fear, and because we're... It's natural, the polemic, um, the fear, the guilt, the victimhood, all the political discourses that surround this, and necessarily so. It's the business of working together in little regional ways and uh, wanting to listen, perhaps more than wanting to speak some of these old languages, wanting to listen because it shifts the power relationship. And I'll tell you, for many... Many people I know, many Aboriginal people I know, and I'm an introvert, so it's not a big number, but uh, it's, it's a surprise and it's empowering having people wanting to listen and wanting to be gifted something and to enter into those sort of relationships and to want to encourage. That, that's something for them. So just to be in those situations, and because it is so local and regional, it's a very different thing than, like when I said we went on to the farm to look at those sites, those people, and this informs my latest novel, Taboo, all this stuff, the business of transformation. The people owning that farm, lovely people, but a very different headset. They're creationists. You know, the, the very young world, and we're all descended from Adam. And to be so apart from where we begin and find ways to converse and share, they're the things that participating in language recovery enable, I think. All right. Thanks very much, Kim. We've just got time for one more question. We might take a, a question. Do you just want to, if, if you want to wait for the microphone to come so we can... I hear you. 
I just want to thank you for a very significant talk because you've you've highlighted a point that we are in a new era and it's a I, I feel it. Um, uh, and as a non-indigenous person, I just want to thank you for the the gift of of sharing about that journey and about the the um, the things that we have to think about as we go forward. So thank you. Well, I think that's a that's a great point to to break for morning tea. So, I want to echo those thoughts. What a what a fantastic presentation! Please put your hands together for Professor Kim Scott.